dedicated to the god Janus. Let's talk about the month of January that is dedicated to the god that lived on the Janiculum Hill. Behind me is the Quadrifrons Arch, known as the Arch of Janus. There were several arches dedicated to Janus. This one may not have been the one dedicated to the god himself, but that's what it's known as. It dates to the time of Constantine. Let's think about the beginning of the year, and this god, this two-faced god from the Janiculum Hill, looks back at the year that transpired, looks forward to the future and the greatness of Rome. Let's take a look at the dates, the events, the religious calendars, the temples dedicated in the month of January, and get familiar with just how frequent history happened in the city of Rome. We're going to look at major events, religious festivals, important temple dedications, events that were particular, that were remembered by emperors and their family members, things like birthdays, death days, ascension days, succession days, and then a number of other important uh, Romans, including uh, Cicero and Marius. So let's take a look at some important days that took place in the month of January. So first of all, we've got this God, God of time, transition, passageways, doorways, and really it's all about for the Romans, the beginning and end of conflict. And so you looked to Janus to favor you to ultimately have a successful outcome in war, followed by peace. And when you had peace, you close the bronze doors of the Temple of Janus in the Forum, basically at the end of the Argolitum Road. And how many times was that doorway, those doors of the temple closed? Just three times in Roman history, we're told, up to the time of Augustus. And we have a coin representation of here uh, from Imperial times. Janus was an important deity to the Romans, and we ourselves are in January right now. And we're glad that the previous year is done and we have new beginnings. We have new hopes. Uh, we, we just want to, you know, start off everything new and everything is possible. And that's how the Romans thought as well. So starting by 153 BC, the consuls will go into office. So the executive officers, you make public vows for the well-being of the state. You take the auspices, you get the approval of the gods, you get the approval of Jupiter. This is all taking place on the Capitoline Hill. You also have a number of festivals. Asclepius, so that's the god of healing from Epidaurus, from the Greek world. And then Beovis, who has a temple both on the Capitoline Hill, but also on the Tiber Island. And this is a deity who basically is a kind of a combination of Jupiter and Apollo. So it's like they're worshiping the um, to say teenage young man version of Jupiter. That's who Veovis uh, is. And then we have some interesting moments to remember. The Julian calendar is basically ratified and in use by 45 BC on the 1st of January. Julius Caesar himself was deified in 42 BC by the second triumvirate, which is going to include Marcus Aurelius, uh, Mark uh, Antony and Octavian and then Lepidus. And then we have to remember a very important moment in Roman history, 193. So you've had the assassination of the emperor Commodus that we famously see depicted in the movie Gladiator, but he's dead, he's the son of, of Marcus Aurelius. And it's the Senate then that ratifies the next emperor and that's Pertinax. And he doesn't last very long, but that's another story. So a lot of things happened historically on the 1st of January. Now let's take a look a little bit at the Tiber Island to familiarize yourself with how it looks and how it's been looking in the past several weeks. We've had a lot of rain in Rome. Hans Fabricius. This is from today. And here is from a few weeks ago, a much higher level of the Tiber River surrounding, really enveloping the Tiber Island.
Tiber Island looked like a boat in antiquity. Here's that portion from the Republican period that looks like the prow, a part of a ship. Tiber Island, still a boat floating in the Tiber. Okay, we can jump to uh, January 2nd to 9th. A lot of things are happening. The Romans do famously remember when the Alemanni are crossing over the Rhine that was frozen and invade the Roman Empire in the middle of the fourth century. That's disastrous for the Romans. On the 3rd of January, Cicero, here he is depicted in the Hall of the Philosophers in the Capitoline Museums, a very grand figure for the late Republic. And he was born in 106 BC. Then we have these movable feasts, the first one of the year, the Compitalia. You're looking at the gods of the crossroads, the Lares. And so through the year, the dates and the worship of these deities can shift and change year to year. It's followed by a lesser known event and festival, Vikapota. It's not your most famous goddess but she is associated with Victoria, the goddess of victory. And in particular, the foundation day of this particular shrine located on the Valia Hill was created basically at the beginning of the Republic of Rome. Because when you kick out the kings, immediately there's pushback and a number of the aristocratic Romans want to bring the kings back. So one of these people, Publius Valerius Publicola, was charged with um, treason against the state. And one of the ways in which he responded to that was to tear down his domus, his house, and replace it with a shrine. And that is the Vika Pota shrine that ultimately, let's say archeologically, we seem to have left track, track of. And largely the Velia Hill is enveloped in the imperial period by the temple of Venus in Rome constructed by Hadrian. Finally, on the ninth, we have a festival honoring Janus. It's his, it's his month and it's his, his festival. And essentially the Agonalia revolves around sacrificing a ram in the Regia, very important holy site in the Roman forum. And then it's followed by an, Agla, an Agonalia for three other deities, Mars, the Jovis, and Sol, associated with Apollo throughout the year. So the Aganalia is something that repeats, but it basically is the same kind of important uh, uh, animal sacrifice, a ram in the same place in the Regia in the Roman form. Okay, from the 10th to the 15th, uh, no slowing down here. And you know, you, you can look on, on Twitter and people talking about events in history and so forth, and this kind of um, uh, presentation today is really kind of tie it all together and give you a sense of the whole calendar because something that pops up on your social media feed and it, I think we're getting saturated with those kinds of um, you know, famous events and we kind of lose track about what, what's the real character and nature of a particular month. And so this idea as we're making our way through ties us, I think, closer to uh, the big picture. So we have Julius Caesar famous crossing the Rubicon. We're not exactly sure on what point of the Rubicon uh, he crossed. We have the Nika riots in Constantinople, a great event in Roman history, but it's over in the new capital of Constantinople. And so we have then this plan that shows you the relationship between the Hippodrome and the great palace of the emperor, which mirrors the relationship established already in Rome, the Palatine Hill Palace and the Circus Maximus. No great, famous, horrific riots take place there in 532. And then we uh, move forward in time again uh, into the fourth century. Theodosius I is born, and he is the final emperor that rules cohesively the eastern and western half of the empire. The Carmentalia brings us back to simpler times, uh, times even before Romulus and Remus, the Carmentalia represents and focuses on a deity, a prophetess, a goddess that also look back in time and forward into the future. 
and she's associated with the Portum Commentale, which is right there at the beginning of the Vicus Jugarius, right there in the Forum Poarium. Okay, we remember uh, a hero and great statesman of the uh, Republican times. Uh, we have Gaius Marius, uh, who was, a, someone said, the strong man, ruler, general, statesman that ushered in, he was succeeded by Sulla, and then Pompey, and then most famously, Julius Caesar. So you can't have a Julius Caesar without having a Gaius Marius. And on the 13th of January, he dies in 86 BC. Happy birthday to Mark Antony on the 14th, 83 BC. Uh, we all know Mark Antony and his rivalry with uh, Octavian and of course his famous lover Cleopatra. On the 15th, you have the death of the Emperor Galba. This is after the suicide of uh, Nero, and you have the year of the four emperors. So Galba, after short reign, gives, gives, uh, is, gives way to Otho, and then from Otho we have Vitellius, and Vitellius, then finally we have Vespasian, and we all know Vespasian because he builds the Colosseum. The 17th to the 23rd, we have again Theodosius, he's now dying on the 17th of January, 395, and what a legend he was. And look where he died, in Milan, Mediolanum. And again, it reminds us that as we move forward in time, the concept of Rome is huge, the empire is huge, but Rome is less and less important. And we have other later capital cities that are developing. And before there's a Constantinople, there's a Mediolanum that acts as one of several capitals of the empire. Uh, Octavian marries Livia. That's one of the most famous uh, couples in antiquity, on this, also on the 17th. We jump to the 19th in 225, and we have Gordian III is a young emperor of Rome and uh, emperor in a, in a volatile time. And Lucius Verus, that I'm showing you right here on the right, he was a co-ruler with Marcus Aurelius. So many people forget that or don't even know that. Marcus Aurelius, a great philosopher king, started off ruling with Lucius Verus, but he dies, possibly due to the uh, Antonine Plague, on the 23rd of January, 169, leaving Marcus Aurelius to rule alone. Here he is. Arguably sporting the most trendy uh, ornate beard uh, in ancient Roman times for an emperor. And then January 23rd, Theodosius I, he proclaims his son Honorius, aged nine, as his co-emperor. And he'll become the first emperor of the Western Empire uh, as we have the East and West that is split up. And then we're gonna have Honorius and Arcadius as the brothers East and West. On the 24th to the 27th, First standout is Caligula, and this is a miniature uh, representation of the emperor. It's fished out of the Tiber. It's a very famous portrait. He's assassinated on the 24th of January, AD 41. He rules only four years, and he's considered to be one of the most irresponsible, crazy emperors of ancient Roman times, and we'll be spending some time in the future talking about him in a separate uh, lecture. Uh, on that day, Hadrian was born, considered to be one of the greatest, most educated, most cultured emperors of the Roman Empire. On the 25th, Claudius succeeds uh, Caligula, so the day after, right? He's propped up by the Praetorian Guard. And from the 24th to the 28th, we jump into old, old religion, the basically another movable feast but it is uh, this festival of sowing. So you can imagine the simple agricultural uh, lifestyle and, and uh, way of life of the Romans started off with farming. So obviously sowing crops, uh, cultivation, harvest are going to always remain big in the Roman calendar, even it becomes after it becomes the great urban capital. Uh, Nerva dies on the 27th succeeded by Trajan. He dies in the Horti Solistiani, uh, which we have near the American embassy today. And then finally, the 
the creation day, the inauguration day of the Temple of Castor and Pollux right in the heart of the Roman Forum, one of the two grand uh, Republican structures, Republican temples created in the uh, fifth century. That's the Temple of Saturn and then the Temple of Castor and Pollux, looming large, last built by Tiberius in AD 6. On January 30th, two famous people were born. Didis Julianus, who is the famous emperor in the year of the five emperors that won his position as emperor by paying the most for an auction hosted by the Praetorian Guard. He's born in 193, and in 58 BC, Livia Drusilla, the most famous wife of Augustus, such an incredible character, and it's no surprise that on her birthday, the Ara Pacis, the dynastic monument in the Campus Martius, was dedicated in 9 BC. And finally, the last day of the month, January 30th, in 36 BC, Antonia the Younger, Antonia Minor was born. Now she's the daughter of Mark Antony and Octavia Minor, that is, the sister of Augustus, and she was the wife of Nero Claudius Drusus and the mother of Claudius and Germanicus, grandmother of Caligula, and great grandmother of Nero. Here is her image that is located today, a colossal figure in the Palazzo Altams of Museo Nazionale Romano.